Um, my name is Blake. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for joining tonight, for spending your Wednesday evening with me. Thank you, uh, VDOT guys, for having me on. Uh, this will be a lot of fun. I'm excited about it. Physical stress theory is not something that I knew going through school. It's sort of something I stumbled on uh, relatively recently, actually. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. But um, it, it's sort of tied together all, the, all the, the theories and things that we learn about in school together really nicely in a nice kind of framework um, that I can utilize. Um, so, you know, the subtitle here is why do injuries happen and, and how can we manage them effectively? So we'll sort of be explaining that and we'll try to try to get through here relatively quickly. Um, quickly about me, my, my name is Blake Dirksen. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and certified strength and conditioning specialist at Bespoke Treatments in New York City. Um, I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, I'm currently the assistant coach of the high school cross country and the track and field team there. Um, and that's kind of a cool role because I'm able to, you know, sort of straddle both that rehab and performance spectrum. Uh, I'm able to help guide folks through that, that pain experience, but also work with some high level athletes. And, and you learn a little bit about a lot of things in, in, on both ends of those spectrum. Um, the, 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 Physical stress theory uh, does a really nice job of answering some of those fundamental questions of like, what's, why, why do we get injured? Why is exercise an effective modality? Um, and how does our body adapt to some of these stressors? Um, it does a good job of making some of these complex topics fairly simple. Um, you might hear some of these topics that we'll go over and, and, and think to yourself, that makes sense, or yeah, I already do that. Um, and I'm hoping that this framework will sort of help fill in some gaps and reinforce what you've already been doing uh, and make you a bit more confident in your coaching journey um, with, with some of the maybe diagnoses or um, some of the injuries, aches and pains that pop up along the way. Um, so the basic premise of the physical stress theory is that changes in relative level of physical stress cause a predictable adaptive response in every biological tissue. So things like your muscles, tendons, ligaments, bones, um, even things like your, you know, integument, cardiopalm system, uh, sort of these sort of fundamental physics equations, um, then we can start to apply that to um, the runner in front of us. And, and things will just start to make a little bit more sense about why this injury occurred in the first place or or, or how to best navigate it. Um, so the first one, I won't, I won't spend too much time here, but we'll sort of keep referring to these force equals mass times acceleration. Mass in this case would be like your body weight. Acceleration would be a change in velocity over time. So either increasing in velocity or decreasing in velocity. Um, stress is your force divided by area, right? So for a given force, um, the, a smaller area will uh, produce more stress. Uh, a bigger area will reduce that stress. And you can think of that like a pinpoint, you know, really, really small surface area for a given force is going to be uh, pretty painful. But if you were to do the same thing, like with a uh, baseball bat, something that's really big and broad, that stress would go down just because you're sharing that load over a greater area. Um, force can be applied in, in any direction. Um, the four directions that are relevant with musculoskeletal injury are tension, shear, compression, and torsion. Um, and again, these are these are predictable adaptive responses. So, you know, if you, if you don't ever do anything, you're a total couch potato, you're going to have a predictive, uh, predictable adaptive response where your, your, your muscles, your bones, your ligaments, everything will atrophy and sort of decrease in size versus this guy here on the right who is constantly under tension, constantly producing force um, and has turned into, uh, you know, Hulk mania. Um, I hesitate even putting this, this photo on the slide because runners, you know, notoriously don't like strength training because they feel like this is what's going, they're, what they're going to turn into. Um, but it just sort of illustrates the point nicely that um, if you don't do anything, you will atrophy. If you do do stuff, if you do put yourself under tension, under force, under load, you will hypertrophy and get stronger. Um, this is not the case. This guy is, is not natural, um, but we'll move on. This image here does a really nice job of sort of address or, or illustrating the entire concept. So this exists on a continuum, uh, the thresholds for adaptation. On each end of the continuum, on the low load side, you've got cell death. And on the top end, you've got cell death. I think the, the top end makes a bit more sense. Right here in the middle, you've got that maintenance period. We're gonna to touch on these a little bit more down the road. Um, right here, you've got hypertrophy. Uh, and if you increase the physical stress even more, you'll enter that injury zone. Uh, and if you keep increasing the physical stress, um, you'll get to a point where there is cell death. Uh, and that essentially just means you won't ever be able to get back to that maintenance phase. The, the tissue there has, has perished, it's, it's, it's expired. Uh, and, and same thing down here, if you are, are way underloaded, uh, that cell death can occur there as well. Uh, and this figure here to the right does a nice job of demonstrating when someone is injured, they are at a lower threshold set point. Um, 
and so they're they're not able to handle as high of a physical stress meaning for the same physical stress it would they, they wouldn't be able to handle that same load um, before getting into that injury phase so we're sort of always writing that line between you know adaptation and injury right there's always these aches and pains that are going to come up um, and and to to adapt and, and to push an athlete and to continue to progress them especially at an elite level where these where these gains are so marginal um, you are sort of always sort of writing that line between right here this is actually called um, what is this called I'll get to it in a later slide but it's 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 the, the threshold line right here the maximal stress threshold and you're sort of sort of always teetering back and forth um, you know giving that that adequate stress for the quality session of the week uh, and then and then dialing back and making sure that we're getting enough recovery and so you know, as a PT, um, it, it's, it's I, I tend to see folks in this domain generally, just, that's just sort of nature of my job. Yeah. Um, but, but as a coach or, you know, as someone that wants to prepare for, let's say, a marathon or something, um, we are going to be, you know, really hammering this and building as, as big and robust of a system as possible. And that's sort of the the purpose of the talk is like the, the stronger you are, the more work capacity you'll, you'll be able to handle. And so, you know, you can think of a base phase serving that purpose, right? A really long base, robust base period where you're just doing sort of the steadier state mileage and maybe some neuromuscular work there. Um, that the, the purpose of that serves is to one, develop a really, really robust um, cardiopalm system, um, but also to make sure that the, the peripheral muscular to, uh, musculoskeletal system is strong enough to handle the faster work that you're about to be doing. Um, so yeah, from, from a PT perspective, I want to get the athlete as strong as they'll let me, you know, and that sort of means as strong as, or it, you have to play into their, their work schedule. You have to make it something that they're going to want to do, um, something that will remain, will, will retain a high level of compliance. Um, and so, it, you know, you're sort of juggling all these different pieces, um, and at the same time, convincing them that strength is important. Um, and especially if someone has a past injury history, you know, those are certainly areas that we really want to rectify and, and create robust tissue around. This is Karen Dunn speaking. Um, so when you talk about increased tolerance, injury, and then you said that was cell death at the top and cell death at the bottom, yep. and you said you never get that back. Did I hear that right? Yeah, we'll get we'll get to these a bit more later. I've I've never experienced cell death. You you might you might see this. Well, this would, and and this is also another principle of this theory is that um, this doesn't just apply to the musculoskeletal system. This applies to all tissue in the body, right? So think of a myocardial infarction. Think of a heartache or a heart attack, um, where that 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 heart is in, in seizure, and and that that heart muscle tissue it's no different i mean it, it, it's different but essentially it's a muscle pump um and it's not getting the right the adequate blood flow and nutrition and oxygen that it needs and so that cell those cells will die uh and they won't be able to be brought back it'll be replaced by scar tissue your heart will be less compliant it will be less efficient um, and so that's essentially the, the same thing that's happening here i haven't seen this in a musculoskeletal domain except for the case of someone that has rhabdomyolysis um, which is essentially where they, someone is working so hard for so often at such a high intensity that um, there's, their muscle cells essentially rupture. Um, and, and there are cases there where cell death uh, does occur and, and we aren't able to get back and to that. Is case. that something, and I don't mean to harp on this topic or sidetrack you, but is that something the athlete would be able to recognize? Or is it almost like, is this, it sounds like it's a point of overtraining Right. Yeah, yeah, you would see you would see overtraining syndrome um, factors before you would see cell death. Yeah, that's it's pretty pretty serious to see something like cell death. I would I would, and I'm not exactly sure on this, but I would reserve that for like your extreme extreme endurance events, um, or someone that is really really hammering. And you know, you as a coach are, are able to sort of guide them. It, to, to, to have rhabdo would require someone not following your prescription, not following that Jack Daniels type program. Um, they would have to be, you know, redlining it um, the majority of their days. And, and I'll get to a little bit later um, the 80-20 rule um, that, that that's a good one to follow. They sort of have that on the opposite end. They do 80% intensity, 20% uh, aerobic type work. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. This, this box here is really important. Um, we all work with athletes um, who are, you know, unique, unique individual, uh, comprehensive human beings. Um, it's not as simple as just plugging in an algorithm and, and, and getting uh, an export. 
Uh, they're not cyborgs. They have you know comprehensive uh, backgrounds and belief systems. And so this is this is a really important box that you know we could spend an entire lecture on. But I want to touch on a couple important ones as they relate to running. Um, muscle performance is essentially your strength or your force generation, your ability to produce power, uh, motor control. Um, you know, we know that running is is not easy. Um, anybody can just sort of get out, throw some shoes on, and run. But we know that running itself uh, is a skill, and it's it's a learned um, it's, it's a learned uh, motor skill. Uh, it takes time, and, and so we need to think about that when we're when we're working with um, novice runners or folks that are newer to the sport. Um, posture and alignment from a runner standpoint, that would be your biomechanics. Um, extrinsic factors that go into the physical stress of someone would be their, you know, their footwear, um, orthotic devices they may be wearing. Psychosocial factors, this is a really big one. Um, I sort of wish it was fleshed out a bit here more, but it, it's, I'm glad it's here. It's a really important one that we consider, especially in the rehab and sort of when you're working with someone in, in pain. Um, psychosocial is huge. Um, and so this, this sort of captures the, the work stress, the financial stress. Um, school stress, uh, some of those psychosocial factors that, that all go into the same cup. And I keep using the word stress. Um, and, and so far, I've sort of used it as a, as a physical stress, right? Like someone's doing 100 bicep curls, that is a physical stress. Um, but we also have psychosocial factors. We also have so psychosocial stress. We have nu nutritional stress. Um, and so all of these sort of need to be accounted for when we're working with runners and, and thinking about um, their, their overall training program. Uh, and then lastly, you have this physiological factors, um, medication, age, obesity. Those are all things that are going to systemically uh, affect the, the person's ability to tolerate load and tolerate the training that you're giving them. This is taken from PT and the context here is pain, um, but it also applies to what we're doing here. And the idea is that you've got this cup and you've got all these different stressors going in uh, into that cup. And when the cup overflows, that's when you are at, at heightened risk for sensitization for pain in this case, or greater risk for, for injury uh, from a musculoskeletal standpoint. Um, so just a nice illustration. I don't need to spend too much time here. Uh, but now we're getting into the fundamental principles of, of PST, um, where we start talking about atrophy, hypertrophy, uh, cell death, um, and feel free to stop me here. Um, atrophy essentially is just that tissue, when tissue de degeneration is greater than tissue production. Um, and so, you know, think about this when you are going in between seasons or when you're spending time away from uh, training due to injury. Um, it really doesn't take that long to lose fitness or strength gains. Um, about 10 days or so. And so if you're taking two weeks totally off after a season or big race, um, and you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of taking time off. I think that's it's important and, and well-deserved, um, but we just want to make sure that when that athlete gets started back to their training cycle, that we're not doing that too quickly or we're not just jumping them right back in. And especially if you've taken two weeks completely off, you really need to um, sort of scale that back and progressively load them um, because we know that, that, that atrophy has taken place. And when atro atrophy has taken place, that, that threshold is lower, their capacity for work is lower. Um, and maintenance is sort of that middle. There's no, no change in turnover of, of, stress, of, of tissue there. Um, it's this, you can sort of think of this one as like the athlete who's done three miles every day for the last 30 years. Uh, originally, maybe his first couple weeks there, there was that adaptation hypertrophy um, change. Uh, but then after that, it became very maintenance for him or her. Um, there's still without a doubt a health benefit to doing that, but no ad adaptation is happening. Um, the body likes controlled stress, the body likes variety. And so, you know, if you, I, I would encourage anyone to just sort of mix things up every now and then whether, and that, that's what's going to happen naturally with the training cycle, right? You're going through these different training stressors with the intention of, of, of peak performance uh, for whatever that, um, whatever that race distance might be. Um, going into hypertrophy, we've got tissue degeneration, which is less than tissue production. So tissue production is higher. Um, and this can only happen in the presence of adequate recovery, right? So talking back to um, that 80-20 rule, which was made, made um, popular by Stephen Cillier, um, he, he took retroactive data. He looked at a bunch of athletes, a bunch of Nordic skiers, a bunch of endurance athletes, and looked at their training logs um, and found that the most elite athletes were the ones that were spending about 20% of the time at this higher intensity work, whereas the other 80% of their training time was spent at that lower, lower intensity work. Um, and so that's sort of a general rule that you can use, that you, you can follow um, to make sure that you are giving yourself, the, giving your athlete or yourself the appropriate um, time away from that intensity training so that you can adapt to the stimulus that you gave during those quality sessions. Um, and going back to that uh, the injury where we sort of breached that hypertrophy threshold, the maximum stress threshold, which is what I was trying to think of earlier. 
Um, tissue is essentially just defined as tissue damage caused by excessive stress resulting in pain or discomfort, impaired function of the tissue, or both. Um, so injuries are, are things that we've all experienced before and our athletes have as well. And again, this is if injury, if injured or high stress is so high that it's crossed even the injury threshold, cell death can occur. And I think the best way to think of this is just that heart attack example um, where the cell death just is, is not going to come back. You're not going to get that heart um, tissue to repair. Uh, second piece, this one's really important. We're sort of going back to some of those physics equations earlier. We're thinking of magnitude. We're thinking of time. We're thinking of direction. Um, when someone comes into the clinic uh, with, with me, this is actually our clinic here in New York. Um, when someone comes in with an injury, um, I'm sort of reverse engineering what, what could have happened and why they might be experiencing this, this pain. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about their gait. I'm thinking about their shoe wear. I'm thinking about their cadence. I'm thinking about um, their, their training, whether it's intense or whether it's, it's a bit you know, longer sustained threshold pace and stuff. Um, so I'm really trying to reverse engineer to, to figure out what the magnitude uh, and the time and direction, all these, all these values that are going into, into someone's system. Um, magnitude, time and direction, you, you can think of this two, two different examples, one being an ankle sprain, the other being like, let's say, Achilles tendonitis, right? The ankle sprain uh, has a much shorter time. It's a really, really high force, magnitude of force under a short, short amount of time. And because of that, it's, it can be really, really intense. So, you know, with an ankle sprain, it's not uncommon to tear uh, ligaments. Uh, with a severe ankle sprain, you can tear all your ligaments, you can tear tendon, you can even uh, avulse bone off of the bone. Um, so that, that because of that decrease in time, uh, the force is much higher. So there, there's one of the physics equations earlier, the, the decrease in time uh, will, will increase, it will produce a higher stress uh, versus something that's more repetitive in nature, something that's a bit um, slower to occur. Um, it's, it's, it's that slow duration, high repetition work that, that eventually leads to something like, let's say, Achilles and uh, tendonitis. Um, when inflammation does occur uh, following an injury, the injured tissue is going to be less tolerant to stress than it was previously. Um, and that one of those photos showed the lower threshold. It's a nice way to think of it. Um, and when that happens, when the inflammation is there, uh, it's important to protect the, the injured area, respect that healing process, um, and let, let the, everything sort of take its course. That's sort of, I guess, my role as a PT is to sort of diagnose, know exactly what we're dealing with. Um, sort of offload that area and then build up the areas around it so that we can make sure we, we jump right back into training as quickly as possible. Um, stress threshold thresholds vary among, <clears throat> among individuals. Um, so it's going to be different from one athlete to the other, given their background, uh, given their nutritional status, their, their um, physiological status, their age, those sorts of things that we touched on earlier. Um, one more thing that's up here, and we've already actually touched on it, is that it doesn't all just apply to the musculoskeletal system. It's going to apply to the cardiovascular system, the pulmonary system, uh, nervous system, uh, integument, right, the skin. Um, this, this, these sort of things apply to, to the entire system of the body. Running is a really pretty demanding task, right? You're essentially plyometrically jumping from one foot to the other, to the other, to the other, back and forth, back and forth. And tendons are really great at storing energy and releasing energy. That, in fact, that's their entire purpose. Um, they essentially act as springs, and, and there's none greater than the Achilles tendon. Um, about 80% of our running stride is through the passive mechanics uh, of our musculoskeletal system, meaning we're not actively propell propelling ourselves. It's our tendons that are storing that energy. In addition to our, our muscles, too, they're storing that energy, but then also releasing that energy. Um, so the tendon has a, a really big role to play. Um, and I, I think probably the biggest thing would be to figure out what the loading program would be and uh, figure out where you are in that sort of continuum, right? What's what's your baseline strength? What's your functional strength? I'd have you come into the clinic and, and, and perform heel raises. Let's see how strong you are there. Um, and then, and then sort of enter you into that, that load continuum. So if you think of a continuum, um, you know, on one end, you have just sort of moving the, the ankle up and down, up and down um, with almost no load, maybe against gravity or something. And then on the other end, we have jumping with, with weight or, you know, bounding or hopping on one foot. Um, in between that, you've got, you know, a bunch of different uh, strengths and, and, and ways that you can load the body. There's always a temporal component. Um, there's always a, a load component. Um, and so we're figuring out sort of where you fit into this continuum and how we can continue to shift you to the right side to, to further along that continuum so that you can um, be able to handle plyometric load and handle powerful exercise because that's, that's what running is. And, and if you're doing 90, 100 miles a week, then you need to be able to handle that. Um, and so 
if you, if that if that foundational and, and that if that base of foundation strength isn't there and we just continue to load it plyometrically uh, through running, um, you're just sort of pissing that tendon off even more, even more, even more. And then you take some time off, you rest it, you ice it, you roll it, you stretch it. In the meantime, there's no load going into that tendon, so it's not getting stronger, right? We're, we're going back the opposite way. We're going more towards that hypertrophy into the spectrum, or I'm sorry, atrophy into the spectrum. And then when you want to jump back into training, you've, you've atrophied a little bit. Your, your threshold's lower now. And so then you jump back into training, and, and it just sort of happens all over again. And so we need to make sure that that tendon is strong, it's robust, it can handle um, the, the demands that you're asking it to do. Um, and that's that's sort of how I, I manage tendons. It's, it's, um, they, they can be frustrating. They can be, um, they can be really painful. Um, I, I will say with tendons, you're generally um, okay to – train through some of it you know there's there's always going to be a little discomfort with with tendon pain um that's just sort of part of the rehab process so getting the athlete to understand that there's going to be a little bit of discomfort as we go through this rehab plan you can get back to running given these guidelines you know whatever that might be um when, when someone's getting back to running i tell them no more than five out of ten out of five out of ten pain scale um they can't be compensating they can't be limping um there shouldn't be any sharpness or shooting pain um and you know we we, we start uh, at a, a regress level and then eventually build back up to what they're doing and, and you can certainly do things like cross training and, and, and things like that in the meantime. Yep. So so how do we manage this all effectively? That's sort of the big question and some of the takeaways what we'll have here. Um, training logs are are huge. Um, you know, I when I was in high school we had a, a pen and paper um, training log. Uh, I know athletes still use those. I'm I'm sort of an Excel person now. I do everything on Excel. Uh, and then sort of transfer it over to, to VDOT. Um, I actually just started I, with the high school guys. I just had a, a high school kid join. Uh, he told me he tracks mileage by tallying, doing four marks and then a slash on like post-it notes on his wall, uh, which I thought was great. Um, I'm just sort of like picturing um, his room that looks sort of like a jail cell kind of, you know, it's just like how many days he's been there or how many miles he's been there <laughs> a month. Um, I've never heard that. I thought it was really great. Um, but yeah, training logs are huge, right? Volume is, is an important piece. How many miles a week are they running? Is there, you're watching for big spikes um, and, and workload intensity is really important as well. Um, both of those two go hand in hand and sort of sticking to that 20, 80, 20 rule. Um, I, I don't put too much emphasis on volume. You know, I'm working with the athlete where they're at for that given time, right? So in the high school domain, um, you've got freshmen that are maybe completely new to running that are going to be different from a, a senior four years down the road that is, is more equipped to handle higher volume. So um, volume is really just sort of a byproduct of the, the training that I'm trying to get out of the athlete, right? So a senior is going to have longer workouts because it's going to take those longer workouts to uh, elicit those ad adaptations. And so volume just sort of follows what the training plan is. Um, but, but workload intensity is, is a really one, uh, an important one to follow as well. On my Excel sheet, I try to in some way uh, quantify, you know, how much of that intensity is, is going into the athlete um, by, by sort of delineating some of the faster work that we do versus the, the more aerobic work that we do. Um, and then again, subjective reports are, are hugely important. Um, and, and, you know, following up with the athlete on especially those quality sessions, you know, how, how did this feel? Because um, that's going to give you a, a like the best tool to figure out how was that workout and and the one that's going to be similar down the road should we adjust in some sort of way um so rpe is 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 uh, the rate of perceived exertion it's actually quite a really validated metric um in, in uh in research um but also overall well-being fatigue levels motivation levels those give you a window into the athlete's overall stress um, so just touching on RPE again, it's, you know, you can use a zero to 10 scale, I think is what it is. Um, you can also use a 16 to 20, uh, I think that's right, six, six to 20 scale uh, is, is a different one. Um, some of them have like the faces on them, like the smiley face is a zero, you know, and then a, a frowny, like really uh, hard grimacing face is a 10. Um, but that just sort of gives the athlete, and I think it's nice for the athlete too, because they're sort of doing some introspection. They're, they're thinking of their body. They're thinking of how that workout was. Uh, and again, it's, it's something that's more valuable over time. Once you have more data points and you can sort of start to, um, you can start to work, look at workload intensity. You can start to look back at previous training. Um, and then the next level of training, the next level of performance is, uh, heart rate variability and other central nervous system monitors. This is something that I... 100% see the value in, and, and I'm really excited to start using. Um, I've started 
sort of experimenting with myself. Um, but this is sort of that like next level uh, performance uh, training where you're where you're able to gather, you know, another set of data points to like, then match with other data points and just get a more full picture of, of what the athlete's stress levels are. Um, and so heart rate variability um, is essentially an indirect measure of your central nervous system and your overall stress load. So going back to that cup model or that, that box with all those other factors, um, you know, we're working with an individual that might have psychosocial stress from finance or work or, or school or relationship. Um, we have nutritional stress. You know, if, if you are, you know, in a starvation mode that your, your HRV will reflect that, your central nervous system will reflect, will reflect that. Um, and this is essentially just measuring um, that indirectly uh, your, your overall stress from a central nervous system perspective. And the central nervous system is important. It's the, it is the thing that governs the entire body, right? So muscles don't work without the brain, and they work a lot better when the, when the central nervous system is primed and ready to produce force. And so all that force comes from the motor cortex, and, and, and we can see these sort of this, you know, in a similar way, we can, we can sort of predict um, when an athlete uh, will perform well or not perform well or, or is ready to train or not to train. And, you know, it's, it's just a tool, you know, and, and we can't put all the stock into one reading. Um, there will always be exceptions, um, but it is nice to sort of gather that data, to, especially if you're working at a high, high level um, to, to start to put those pieces together and, and create a really good profile uh, of the athlete that, you, that you're working with. Um, Omega wave is another one that does direct current to the brain and, and sort of the opposite way. So you're measuring brain current, um, but cool tool. Um, you know, it, there's a, there's a lot of really great resources out there. It, it I looks got a like, question for yeah, you. Go for it. We use the, the app, the V.02 app from Jack Daniels, and we use the heart rate and the workload intensity. We do all that. And that app actually takes care of all that for us. And our kids, most of our kids have a uh, GPS watch with a heart rate monitor that logs in. But the only issues that I have seen over the last couple years is when we say that we, they're doing an easy run. I'm just giving you an example. Yep. Uh, and their heart rate's supposed to be between like 67 to 79% uh, of their maximum heart rate. All right. <clears throat> and so, what what formula or what way do you would you be able to measure an uh, an accurate maximum heart rate so you do get the like the seventy nine percent maximum heart rate when you're doing an easy run because if we just do the regular formula two twenty minus their age and so forth say your kid is a freshman in high school, uh, college they're like two o two or something like that but their their easy runs are really high all right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. My it's, question uh, is, is how, what would be the most accurate way to do that? Then? Yeah, they, the 220 minus your age is sort of, um, it, it's one way to do it. It's, there's another formula called the Carbonin formula, um, which is, I can pull it up now, but it's, um, I obviously don't know off the top of my head. It's um, max heart rate minus resting heart rate times training percentage plus resting heart rate. So, you know, it, it's a bit more complicated. It's not difficult to do, but um, it's 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 more accurate than that. Uh, Two twenty minus your age. Mm -hmm. The best way to do a uh, heart rate um, max test is to get someone on a treadmill and have them do a, a VO two max test. Have them go to exhaustion, um, and 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 you know you could probably even do this if you're measuring that closely and you have folks wearing uh, chest straps. You know, have someone do a really intense anaerobic session, and they're they're likely going to max out at heart rate. You're going to hit that max heart rate threshold uh, if the intensity is high enough and for long enough. Um, so that's one way you could do it, uh, and then you could sort of um, retroactively, you know, just uh, create the percentages from that point. It's going to be different for everyone. It's going to be different uh, based on age, based on what they ate, um, based on stress levels. Um, so heart rate's a, it's a nice way to sort of quantify the intensity that you're doing. Um, and, and if you want to get really, really specific with it, I would probably suggest, um, doing a max, uh, max test or just using the Carbonin formula, which is going to be a bit more accurate than the, um, than the 220 minus your age. Uh, okay. It, I'll have to look that up. What's that called? I got to get a pen and pencil down. Yeah. Yeah. Carbonin. It's a K A R V O N E N. 
And, um, and my assistant knows that. She just texted me. Oh, nice. <laughs> good. 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 <laughs> Perfect. Uh, okay. Because that's, it's, we follow it. It, it, it actually works out really well. But the only problem is, is that that curve, there's always that somebody with a real low max yep. and then somebody with a real high max. And we just don't know. I, I just don't. I just want to make sure I'm a little bit more accurate with it. Yeah, yeah, and um, it depends on your population, right? If you're working with younger kids, um, it's it's probably going to be a little bit more stable. Um, but if you're working with an, an older person that's on medications, especially beta blockers, things like that, where the, the heart rate is affected, you know, it's you, you need to consider those as well. Uh, and they'll probably those formulas will probably be a little less accurate. Uh, intensities will probably be a little less less accurate. But yeah, if if the heart rate intensity zones are are, are effective. I would I would have each individual athlete sort of test their max, and then then you'll have that that max for that individual athlete, and that sort of equalizes normalizes the the, the group. Elite HRV is is the system that I use. Um, little finger strap here, uh, chest strap is going to be the most effective, uh, most most uh, accurate. Um, they they say that their their finger strap is is really accurate. Uh, goes Bluetooth to the phone, and then this would be. Uh, an individual dashboard. One, the one thing that's cool about this is that it, uh, you can also have team dashboards here as well, uh, where if you're working with a group of people um, you can, you can, uh, that are going through a similar training cycle, you can sort of trend those at, on a group level too. So uh, check it out. It's cool stuff. Um, this is um, just sort of illustrating the idea again, kind of going back to the physical stress theory. Tim Gabbett uh, has popularized this idea, the, the acute to chronic workload ratio, um, it's saying the same thing. Uh, sort of, um, you've got this sweet spot here where you have decreased injury risk, um, too much training load, uh, you're at a higher risk, and, and also too little training load, you're also at a, at a higher risk. Um, we also just need to make sure that we're um, taking into account all those other uh, stress, uh, stressors like uh, psychosocial stress and nutrition stress and things like that, sleep stress. And the takeaways. So Injuries aren't preventable, um, the, but we can manage the risk through thoughtful programming. And when in injuries do happen, often a deload period to that area is needed uh, while we're, we're still balancing that fitness through cross training, uh, strength work, gait changes, shoe choice, terrain choice, and things like that. Um, the stronger the tissue is, the greater its workload capacity. Uh, and importantly, the opposite is true, um, you know, especially for those folks that, that don't enjoy lifting. This is maybe uh, the best best thing you can say is you, you'll the stronger you are the less likely you you are to get injury injured um, and so think about how this will impact your novice runners your seasoned vets and you know just realize that strength and being able to tolerate what you're asking of, of the athletes is is really really important um, speed training has a greater stress uh, force per area that's a potent but effective stimulus that's sort of why we do less volume of that um, takeaways number two, I'll sort of let you read through here, but these are variables that in theory will put extra stress on the various areas. Um, so, you know, I'll just go through the calves. Uh, an increase in velocity will put more, um, more force into the calves, lower drop shoes. Uh, you can think of like a racing flat or a, a spike. If you've ever worn those first time in the season, your calves are just blown up the next day. Um, barefoot running will also stress the foot and the calf complex more and, and running at an incline uh, also. So same idea with these. So if you have an athlete that's injured in any of these areas, maybe consider some of these factors that might be stressing that area even more uh, and just tra adjust training appropriately. And the takeaway number three, the most important variable is strength. So you know, if you're strong enough, the biomechanics, the shoe wear, the terrain, the speed, less of an issue, less of a factor. If you're strong enough, you should be able to handle it. Um, focus on strength, and, and here's a really nice example. Um, and speaking of stress, all of my links, none of them worked. I don't know what happened, um, but I do have the video right here. So let me just play this really quickly. Um, this is illustrating the point that um, if you're strong enough, you can handle it. Right, so with that we see, you know, that huge knee collapse, that valgus of the knees, the arms are flailing, the, the, the foot's externally rotated, she's pronating like crazy, yet she is a London Marathon champ, she is a New York City Marathon champ, and she got silver at the Olympics. And so, um, you know, if the athlete's strong enough, that's, that's an that's a efficient form for her, for this given athlete. Um, and so, you know, everybody's a little bit different. 
Um, that's it. That's all I got. I want to thank you guys for, for spending your time with me and for the good questions. Certainly uh, open to hearing more questions. Uh, if you have anything, uh, you can connect with me here at BlakeDirksen.com, uh, Instagram. My personal website, uh, Bespoke Treatments, is where, where we are with the, the PT clinic. And then this Backroads Run Company uh, hosting a high school running camp this summer virtually. So check that out if you're interested. Hey, Blake, I, I have a question. Thanks for the for the class. It was really good. Uh, I just wanted to hear uh, your opinion on, um, I know you were talking about reverse engineering. Uh, on the um, on the Achilles tendon problems, what have you seen as uh, one of the main causes? Is, is, have you seen like, for example, shoe selection being a cause of this problem? I know lots of runners have problems with Achilles and I find like there's no one reason, but have you, what have you seen? What, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so yeah, so shoe wear um, is one. Um, when, when someone jumps into like racing season um, and they go to that more aggressive shoe, that, that flatter, that flatter uh, heel toe drop, um, barefoot running got, got incredibly popular, right? That minimalist shoe running got really popular a few years back. Um, Hoka sort of was the opposite, that more maximalist uh, response to that. But at the same time, Hoka has a relatively low heel toe drop. And so uh, I do see folks come in with, uh, that, that have been new to Hoka's um, that, that are experiencing some of these, uh, these Achilles problems. So yeah, the, the, the lower heel toe drop is gonna drop that differential and you're, gonna, you're going to stress that calf complex a little bit more. Um, and so I you know, tell athletes to have a rotation of shoes uh, of various stack heights, of various heel toe drops, of various weights, um, so that you are shifting those loads around um, and, and not only loading one specific tendon, right? So with a, a lower heel toe drop, you're gonna stress that foot and that calf complex more. With a, a higher heel toe drop, you, you might be stressing the, the knee and the hip a little bit more and the muscles that surround those areas. Um, so I, I think that rotating is really important so that we're shifting that load from different body parts. Um, so with the Achilles tendonitis specifically, yeah, terrain also plays an, uh, an important role. If someone has a really hilly terrain and does a lot of uphill running, um, or if they just started doing speed work, um, that's another thing that, that could irritate the calf, um, and, and then shoe choice as well. So uh, with with the with the cross guys or folks that have traditional racing seasons where they do wear spikes or some of these more aggressive uh, racing shoes. Um, you know, we're doing, we're doing strides in them once a week. We're doing workouts in them once a week, just so that when they get to race day, they don't, they don't blow up. So they're, they're, they're accustomed to that stress. They've, they're in maintenance for maintenance mode of that stress, right? So going back to everything we just talked about, they, they're accustomed and adapted to, to that stress. Good question. Yeah. Hi, Blake. Uh, my name is Caitlin. Um, thanks for coming on here and talking to us today. Um, kind of on the topic of injury prevention, um, you know, if I wanted to recommend to my athletes, you know, some simple things they can do, um, you know, to prevent injuries like Achilles tendonitis, um, I've heard that like isometric heel drops, and this is kind of what you talked, talked about, you talked about loading, you know, isometric heel drops or eccentric heel drops, are those something that you would recommend to your athletes to do like every day um, or every other couple days or something like what, what's a, you know, feasible kind of routine for athletes to do that's, that we as coaches can recommend to, to help them prevent injuries like Achilles tendonitis? Right. Yeah. I wouldn't get so hung up on um, the, the way in which you load the, the calf complex, whether it's isometric, whether it's concentric, eccentric. Um, okay. I would just, I would just load it. Um, okay. There, there was a lot of, uh, you know, um, hype and, and excitement around uh, isometrics because in research we saw that these isometrics, at least for the knee tendon, the sure. pelican, um, showed really good effect. And so that sort of, you know, just carries across and spreads to, to everything. Um, but in, in general, especially if there's not pain involved, um, just get folks to start getting strong. Heel raises are a really effective way to do that. Um, and not forgetting some of those smaller stabilizer uh, peroneals and tent post uh, to control the, the finer motions of the foot. Um, but yes, uh, I think it's, it's really important. Um, when, when we're talking about like muscular endurance or um, just building hypertrophy, um, I, I tell athletes um, to go until they get tired and then knock out like another three set, another three reps. And so you go until that muscle burn starts to get there and then you do like three to five more reps. And so 
I was working with someone today, and I was like, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna do the exercise, um, you want you want to make sure it's worth worth your time, right? So go go sure. until you start to feel that muscle burn, and then go a little bit more, and then you'll know that you've you've done an adequate amount of stress. Um, start someone really, especially depending on their training age and, and where they are physically. Um, start conservative, somewhere from two mm -hmm. to three sets might be enough. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's in a novel range, and if it's something that they haven't done before, um, then soreness is likely, uh, and so. You don't want to give someone three sets or four sets and just you know have them not be able to walk the next day. Then you want to have that trust with them. Uh, so start start two sets um, and it's, use those parameters. Um, go till you get tired. Do a couple extra sets and then you can sort of, if you want, put reps behind that once you know what their what their threshold's at. Um, and in terms of frequency per week, um, I like to go with like a two days on, one day off sort of frequency. And so, you know, for 10 days, that would be like six days out of the week, I suppose, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, not, not out of the week, out of, out of 10 days. Um, yeah. And when we're talking about running and we're talking, let's just stick with the Achilles tendon, um, plyometrics are really important too, right? So not just the ability to, to um, not, just, not just strength where we're working on the hypertrophy and the robustness of the tissues, but also plyometrics where we're training the body to we're training those tendons to step load and then quickly and powerfully um, use that use that force. Um, so yeah, plyometrics are, are also a really great thing. Same things like jumps, things like hops, um, skips, uh, and I do those on separate days. It's it's important to make sure that we're not uh, interfering those. So mm -hmm. one day will be more strength focused, the next day will be more um, uh, more plyometric focused. Gotcha. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. Hi, Blake. Thanks for everything. Um, kind of in the same vein of strength being the thing that's going to prevent injuries, if you have a runner who's really just crunched for time on the accessory movements they can do, what are like your top five non-negotiable things that you would want a runner to add into their program to prevent injuries? Yeah, good question. Um, I would sort of take a look and see what they're doing, and I'm obviously biased, um, but just from my own um, perspective and, and experience, um, loading is the most important thing. So if someone's spending, you know, 30 minutes stretching uh, or 30 minutes icing or you know foam rolling, foam rolling is important. Um, but if they're doing some of these ancillary things and it's taking up a lot of time, I would cut those out first, especially if time is an issue, and really focus on on strength, getting them stronger. Um, and if you're working with someone that has, you know, previous injury of history, I would, I would prioritize those movements first. So you know, let's just stick with Achilles tendon, uh, tendinopathy. And so if they have a history of that, let's say they're not, you know, in pain right now, but that's something that you're trying, trying to protect against, um, I would, I would prioritize those, those lower leg movements uh, first, uh, and then slowly work up the chain into, you know, uh, single leg work and double leg work. What about someone who um, doesn't really have a history of injury, but you want to be proactive, and if like you're adding stressors in other ways, you want to be preventative? Yeah, in that case, I'd try and be as comprehensive as possible. Um, so a general program that I would do would hit the quads, would hit the hammies, would hit the lateral hips, would hit the, um, would hit the calves, the main muscle groups for running, uh, and then the core as well. I think those are sort of the five domains that need to be, to, to be hammered. Um, and again, that two to two days on, one day off frequency is a nice one, especially when you're working in that sort of lower intensity strength work. Um, when we're talking about performance um, and someone has that requisite strength, all right, there, there, there's that photo of me in the clinic working with that, that athlete. Um, and, and she is, you know, has done all the requisite work. And now we're working on heavy lifting and, and, and performance lifting is something entirely different than like preventative or prehab type lifting. Um, the intention with, with, with the performance lifting is um, we are trying to recruit as, as much muscle fiber as, as possible. Um, and so we, we do that by things like hill sprints are really great um, and, and things like heavy lifting. Um, so she was using a hex bar there. You could also do a, back, a barbell back squat, a front squat, deadlift. Those sorts of things are really great for recruiting a high amount of, of neural drive to that muscle. Um, which is going to increase your, your efficiency with running. It's going to increase your, your leg stiffness, um, and it's going to give you that, 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 that ending kick um, that, that you'll, be, you'll be able to pass them on in that last 100 meters or so. Thanks. Yep. Blake, you may have mentioned this um, briefly, but um, so I used to do a lot of, I used to do a heavy lift day during the week, and then also what I call a ball and band, um, more lighter weight type of workout. 
Um, and then I also taught a class so that did plyometrics or I was able to do plyometrics for that part. Um, but, you know, now gyms are closed. I'm doing things at home. Um, you know, I can still really kind of incorporate the same exercises, but I guess my question is more so around like timing of it. And, um, you know, is it, is, you know, do you do it the same day as your, your hard workout so that you get more of that recovery time? Um, I just find at the end of my hard workouts, I'm spent and <laughs> yeah, I used right. to be able to do it same day. And now I'm kind of like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and, you know, I want that to be a recovery day. So it kind of windfalls. When's the best time to do these types of workouts? Both, I would say neuromuscular type of stuff like the plyo and the hill sprints um also the heavy lifts when yeah do that? yeah it's a, yeah that's great you're you're um that you nailed it um I, I try and keep energy systems all together right so when i'm doing a more aerobic or more recovery type day that's when i could do more of that higher repetition lower load type work more of that muscle burn strength endurance work um, versus like a heavy day, whether we're lifting heavy or we're doing plyometrics, that that increase in neuromuscular activity. I'll try and I'll try and pair those uh, on the same day. And so you might not like to hear that, but uh, when 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 I'm having a, a day where we're really focusing on neuromuscular activity and, and ramping up, you know, I'm also going to pair that on the workout day that sort of reflects that as well. Um, and if possible, I'd like to have someone do that in the morning and then the opposite and then the lift in the in the afternoon or maybe vice versa. Um, there can be an interference effect that can happen when you, let's say, did a quality workout. And let's say it's a neuromuscular type workout where you're recruiting those fast twitch muscle fibers, where you're trying to elicit those, those speed adaptations. And then you do a, a long, slow, high repetition lift that sort of has a different energy system that you're using. There can be a bit of an interference, interference there. Um, same thing goes the opposite way. So if you're doing a really heavy, high neural output lift, and then you go run an easy five, you're sort of having inter interference there too. And so I like to keep things, energy systems on the same day same stress, uh, give yourself the ability to recover from that and then, and then hit it again. Um, and if possible, sort of space those out within a, a few hours um, at, at the least. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, of course. But if you have any, I guess, closing, closing comments, like we'll, you know, we, we can uh, listen to those and we can, we can wrap. No, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, that's all I got to say. And thanks guys for being here, for spending your evening with me. And uh, hopefully you learned something and 